Oh, Jim Rose, and today we're going to be talking about Geometry and the Interior Life by Anthony Morley. And this book will be reviewing and elucidating on Analysis Sittas by Leibniz. Anthony is an extraordinary Leibniz scholar. And I'm going to be calling the, the work of Leibniz the Analysis of Situation. Um, it is a very difficult text. It is not easy to follow. I've never been able to penetrate it. And Mr. Morley has done so with such skill and such elucidation and has managed to explain the text in such a clear way. It, it truly is remarkable. I, I had the pleasure of reading this book a bit ago, and it's really shaped my thinking ever, ever since. And Mr. Morley makes a few moves to first show why Leibniz wrote the text like he did, uh, why it has been overlooked in Leibniz by a lot of scholars, and why it is so important to take this text seriously, because it really does provide a meta-geometrical um, explanation for how we can think about relations between, say, similarity and difference, and how this, in the, uh, if you take this analysis serious, seriously, which is going to be for Leibniz an analysis of situation, you must always, always think the situation. If you take that seriously, then this can, this can have radical ramifications for logic in general, certainly for mathematics, and ultimately will lead to significant metaphysical and theological ramifications. Now, Leibniz is going to frame his analysis in terms of a comparison between magnitude and situation, suggesting that as mag magnitude is to arithmetic, so situation is to geometry, and furthermore claims that if we make situation and or geometry the primary element, many things easily become cl clear, things which are more difficult to show through the algebraic calculus. Now Leibniz is concerned on calculus or algebra becoming primary in mathematical thinking. He, he will be critiquing Cartesianism, and it's not that algebra has no role in mathematics, but the issue is, is that mathematics that is independent of situation is going to be arising to conclusions or implications that may not take seriously a third element in all judgments or all interpretation or all meaning giving or sense making or what have you, a third element that if we don't take seriously, ultimately it's going to result in us deconstructing and disregarding metaphysics, the human subject, and, and higher concerns. So the stakes are quite high. How Leibniz is going to make this claim is with a fascinating thought experiment that Morley brings out in his work, where he, where he makes the claim that two things are similar, if you can't tell the difference, you, you can confuse one with the other when they're apart. So for example, let's say I have an apple that has a small um, yellow circle on the top of it. And I go upstairs to the bathroom from the kitchen and I see another apple that looks identical. It has a small yellow circle on the top. Well, I easily may wonder, oh my gosh, how does apple get up here so quickly? I didn't, maybe one of the kids brought it. So I pick up the apple and I go back downstairs and lo and behold, it turns out that there are two apples that are identical, that look exactly the same. Now, what's fascinating is by bringing the apple upstairs downstairs, and in the analysis of situation, um, Leibniz makes the example of two temples, then this is exactly the act that unveils the apples are not the same. And yet, it is also the act that confirms they are similar. And this is a very strange double move that if we take very seriously is, is very significant. For it means that my ability to judge things as similar is contingent upon a third thing. And in this case, it would see, say it would be space, it'd be geometry to bring them close together. And once I do that, I can unveil the truth of the phenomenon, which is that they're not the same, but in fact are only similar. But of course, if they're similar, that means they're still different. So they're not the same, only similar. And yet when I experience them in isolation, as far as I know, they are quote unquote, the same. Now I can intellectually know that no two phenomenon in reality are the same, but to really, really experience it, I need to bring them together into the same situation. 
and it is the same situation, it is by bringing them into the same situation that I can then determine the relation and thus say they are the same and so put them under the category of similar. Now, funny enough, I actually think Hegel in the Science of Logic, some of the sections toward the end of the Doctrine of Being, is makes claims of, about mathematics that is actually very similar to Leibniz here. Um, and a s specific measure, specific quantity. And, um, and it's very interesting to thank he Hegel and Leibniz together. And I, I might have to, and I've started to put some notes together. But anyway, um, so what we see now, the other thing Leibniz is going to talk about is you can create a mental si situation where two objects are brought together. So let's say you take that one apple in the kitchen with the yellow spot and you go over to your neighbor's house and you see another apple with a yellow spot in the exact same space. You go, oh my gosh, this apple's the same as the apple back home. What you've done in that is you've taken a phenomenon separated by maybe two miles down the street and you brought the two apples together into a mental situation where you see them together. And precisely in bringing the, them together, that unveils they are not the same, only similar. So you have mentally brought them together into a situation. But the thing that Leibniz really wants to point out here that Anthony just brings out so well is that the only way to make a judgment of similarity between the two apples is by a third thing outside the apples, which is the situation. You have to bring them together in space into the same situation. Um, if it's those two temples, you know, you would have to somehow get them together in geometric space, which if one of the temples that's identical to the other is located in Mexico and the other one is in Egypt or something, you couldn't literally bring them together. So you could say, oh man, it's the same temple. But really, you would be saying that from bringing them together into the same mental situation and making a judgment of the relation. But notice that the object, here's the key, the objects themselves cannot tell you if they are the same or only similar. Like when you went upstairs and you saw the apple in the bathroom that you thought was the same as in the kitchen, the apple in the bathroom could not do anything to tell you oh, this, this is not the same apple as, as in the kitchen. The only way you could tell it wasn't the same apple from the one in the kitchen was to take it from upstairs to downstairs into the kitchen. But the phenomenon itself could not unveil to you it wasn't the same apple. To do that, you had to bring it into relation thanks to a third thing, which is space, you know, the same space, the same situation, and that unveiled the nature and character of the relation. But imagine you took the apple from upstairs and brought it downstairs and the apple downstairs was now gone, then you would just easily conclude without thinking about it that, yep, somehow the apple in the kitchen got upstairs. And so you would put it back and go about your business, never, ever, ever realizing that it is a different apple. So what this would mean is that the phenomenon itself cannot, the phenomenon of the apple upstairs cannot in of itself disclose to you its character, what it is, the fact that it is not the same, that it is only similar. In order to make that accurate assessment, you would have to bring them the, the apple into proximity with the other apple to create a situation. But that ultimately means that the judgment of similarity versus sameness is thanks to you as the subject judging a relation, judging a difference. What this means is that the human subject, what this ultimately means is that all judgment requires, is a, is a result of basically three points. Um, the situations and the two phenomenon being judged. And also too, if it's like your judgment of say, if you like food or not, it would be you, you eating the food and the situation in which you're relating to the food. Like you cannot have judgments because basically if you think about it all judgments of what a thing is is necessarily going to be relational and its relation to other things and and here we start to see you know the hegelian ab logic where a thing is itself in relation to otherness um so likewise like our ability to identify or judge a thing requires us to say categorize it which of course then if i say oh this pizza is good well, then that has to be in relation to other things I've had as good. And basically, what are you doing? You're creating a mental situation where every other food you've had that is good, you're bringing together with the pizza and judging it in the same category as the ice cream you had yesterday, for example. But you are creating a mental situation. 
And so, and so for Leibniz, whenever we're thinking, we're constantly engaging in these, um, these categorizations, these pattern recognitions, we're saying, oh, this has a taste that follows the pattern of good, or oh, the fire truck, the apple, and the, um, and the, and the, uh, the painting over there are the same because they are all, they're all red, they all have red in it. Well, in saying they are all the same because they all have red in it, it is not the things themselves that establish a relation between them. We establish a relation between them and then say there are three red things. Now, this gets at a very important move. What Leibniz wants to suggest, and Hegel does the same thing, is we tend to think that quantity is deeper than quality, meaning like numbers and mathematics, and this is where Leibniz is critiquing like algebra, autonomous algebra, or counting, or basic mathematics, is um, is that when I say, oh, those three things are the same, the funny thing is I'm saying they're the same because of a quality. I'm saying they're all red, therefore there's three red things, therefore they're all the same. Well, the relation that I'm quantifying is possible because of a quality. And yet we do this weird thing where we tend to associate quantity, numbers, mathematics as deeper than quality. Oh, red, you know, the fire truck could be red, blue, or yellow, but there's only one fire truck or there's three objects, you know, we think that the number three, like, yeah, sure, the fire truck could be red or blue or yellow, and the, uh, the painting could have different colors, so the redness is not deep. But what's deep is the fact that there are three things, is what we will say, right? Well, the, the funny thing is, the only reason you say there are three things is because those phenomena have a quality of thingness that you're categorizing, or they have a quality of redness that you're categorizing together. So the number, although it seems more essential than the accident or the qualities, is in fact all quantification is, in, is um, through and relative to a qualification. So quality is actually deeper than quantity. And, and, and yet we tend to think of quantity as deeper. And this is, and you see, the moment you talk about quality, you're talking about situation. And this is where you start talking about Leibniz as a phenomenologist, as some of the Leibniz scholars will talk about, as Morley brings up. Well, the, then, then situation is primary. You always have to think of things in terms of a situation. Otherwise, you can't make sense of them. This is the key. Like, the moment I say there are three things, that only has meaning relative to the situation from which I'm getting the quali qualities that are creating the category of, say, redness, under which I'm saying these three things fall. Well, then the number three has to be put into a situation in which it ha it the number three is represented in three objects that are all read in this situation. Therefore, they can be quantified together. So the, so the quality is more primary than quantity. And yet we do this weird bait and switch, switch where just as soon as we say there are three things, we then go, oh, the three is more real than the red but we wouldn't even talk about the three things unless they shared a quality that we could put together. Now, the, the other reason we, this is problematic, because if you say, oh, the, the fact that there are three things is the quantity is deepest, well, quantity can stand alone objectively without we start saying the number three is like deepest reality because a quantity has no qualification. It does not need to be qualified. It doesn't need to be qualified. And so we come to think of it as objective as standing on its own, as not needing the human element. But you see, if quality is deeper as reality and all quantification is of a qualification, then there has to be a qualifier, someone of whom can recognize qualities, and that would be us. And so humans become primary, and judgment becomes primary, and judgment is always metaphysical. Here's the key. Like, judgment, like the moment you take seriously this meta-geometrical thinking that Leibniz is putting forth, then judgment is huge. And judgment is also big in, in Hegel. And judgment becomes the binding principle. You say those, those things are red, and red constitutes a category, and it is a valid category of quantification, therefore those three things relate. Well, you have engaged in judgment. And the conclusion of that judgment cannot be found in physics. Ergo, you have made a metaphysical move because you've had physics relate to physics. Metaphysics, um, as, as we'll talk about in Reconstructing A is A, has a lot to do when you make the physical reference the physical. So what you have done, you as a human have made a judgment to say how the physical things relate to one another as physical things. And yet that relation cannot be found in the objects. 
and and so the meaning the quant all, all of the meaning of this is is situational like the meaning of what's going on what's going on is always situational and so we have to think situationally not just algebraically and this is where leibniz is big um Anthony has a beautiful paragraph that I'll quote. Um, Man will always differentiate between things with observation, and that is desirable so that we have a good quality of experience. But if we are unable to see the supremely beautiful quality that weaves the many distinct things together, then there is no longer any ground or foundation by which to differentiate things. And in that case, all things become the worst kind of minu minutia and tedium. The notion of similarity, then, is what grounds differentiation in reason itself. It is the harmony of reason and faith. It's a beautiful paragraph. And, and basically, humans are what weave things together as similar, which means they're not the same, but they also relate. And so difference relates because of humans. But we don't tend to take seriously the human's involvement in making phenomenon relate in meaningful and ca meaningful ma ways, as opposed to a giant blob of merging and mixing phenomenon. We don't take to, we don't tend to take that seriously, and thus we don't become good stewards of that metaphysical ability. We don't own it, we don't honor it, and we don't master that skill and ability, because we think quantity and number is more real than quality. And this is a very consequential mistake. The other thing is ultimately the book, what Leibniz is suggesting is why the Trinity is a contradiction. And in fact, the Trinity is the only meaningful, sensible way to think about God um, because God is whole and entire because there are three points that relate to one another. A single thing being itself is always requiring a situation of relations. And so God could not be himself unless he entailed in, inside himself a situation of relating to one another. Um, where each person of the Trinity is observing one another and in that observement, judging a relation between the persons of the Trinity and judging each person as God. And so ultimately, and I'll let the book go into detail on this, but ultimately what Leibniz is suggesting also gets into why the Trinity, um, the, well, the cosmos is in the image and likeness of God. And if God is a Trinity, then we would expect a Trinitarian structure to sensibility in the cosmos itself that the the very possibility of the cosmos being sensible as opposed to chaotic a cosmos as opposed to a chaos is trinitarian is it is a trinitarian uh metogeometrical uh logic and ontology that leibniz is bringing forth um and and so the, for him his 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 defense of geometry ultimately becomes a defense of the possibility of the trinity as well and and that's a fascinating part of the book but mr morley has done just something extraordinary in this text. I would highly suggest reading it. I would highly suggest picking it up. He goes into a lot more than I've gone into here. Uh, Mr. Morley also is an extraordinary economist and he is doing extremely important work on rethinking pricing mechanisms relative to digital assets. And I've had the pleasure and joy of speaking with him and befriending him for a number of years. And I very much suggest his work. It is an honor to um, get to read this text and to think this text and to incorporate this text into my thinking about the world. And I would subscribe to his substack at Intrinsic Macro. I would purchase his book. And for more by Mr. Anthony Morley, please check out his Amazon and substack and YouTube channel as well, where he has lectures on Leibniz today.